All right, a couple of things. Um, one is uh, Professor Clark is offering uh, the principles of macroeconomics class in the first term this summer. So uh, if you're interested in picking up an econ class, um, he is not going to require um, uh, he's not going to require principles of micro. So if you want to just want to take the principles of macro class, it's, uh, it's the first first summer session. Um, the other thing is, um, I'm leaving right after class to drive to Wheeling, West Virginia. I'm giving a talk tonight in Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, so the talk starts at 7, so I'm hoping that drive goes well because it's going to be moderate and close. Um, so anyway, so I won't be in the office this afternoon, and then I'm going to be uh, driving back tomorrow. It turns out my wife uh, is from Wheeling, West Virginia, her, her relatives are from Wheeling, West Virginia. So otherwise, opportunity cost of my time would have been too high. But anyway, she wanted to go. So um, um, I accept an invitation to speak uh, speak there. So I'll be gone uh, this, af this afternoon. I'll be gone uh, tomorrow. But I'll be back uh, for class on Friday. Um, all right. So uh, last time we, were, we uh, demonstrated that if you have trade, then you have more stuff in the world. That is, we didn't we gave an example, and of course, there's a, as I said, there's another example in the book, um, where you don't change the technology of production, you don't change the amount of resources there, but by simply allowing people to trade, then you end up with more stuff in the world. And the reason is because uh, you're looking at opportunity costs. That is, if you get really good at making something, the opportunity cost of making something else gets very high. So you're better off making that thing uh, more than you need and swapping it with someone else uh, who has a higher opportunity cost to making something else. So if you're really good at making uh, cars, uh, then to make corn uh, is really expensive. So you're better off making cars and swapping them with someone who's good at, at making corn relative to cars. So it's not a matter of absolute advantage, but a matter of uh, a comparative advantage, which is really just a matter of looking at what the opportunity cost of things are. So um, if we look at this period uh, in the West, uh, 1450 to 1750, that is a period uh, of trade. It is trade that dominates the, the Western social order. Um, Sometimes you see this also, you know, Adam Smith talks about this in Wealth of Nations, but you might also see it um, as uh, described as mercantilism. That is, um, because for the idea of merchants, uh, this is an era where most of the economic growth is happening uh, due to the uh, institution of, uh, of trade. And also, we'll talk about the institutions that develop uh, in this in this era, uh, such as credit and banking and uh, the idea of a firm distinct from the individual, these things all happen uh, because uh, it, these all happen in this period, 1450 to 1750, uh, which led again to uh, more economic growth. Um, so what what happened here is what we we talked about this a little bit earlier is that the political institutions. The political institutions became dominated uh, by the merchants. Uh, we noted that if you were reading Shakespeare, um, you went from uh, King Henry III to the Merchant of Venice. That is, when you read The Tempest or you read The Merchant of Venice, but this, who, who are in charge, who are the political power? The political power is with the merchants at this time. Very different than if you were looking at 1100 AD. It wasn't the merchants that were politically powerful, but the kings and the lords were the political power. Um, so the, 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 this period, 1450 to 1750, you really have sort of a, a power vacuum that was filled by the merchant class. Because if we, again, uh, there was no one, we mentioned last time, there was no dominant authority that could hold the feudal system together. It was being uh, outcompeted by the trading cities. It couldn't handle the labor force changes that were necessary because of plagues and droughts. 
Uh, and so the, by the time we get to 1450, nobody's really operating in the feudal system any longer. And again, it wasn't that someone just jumped up and said, okay, no more feudalism. It happened gradually over time. It was just a, a Hayekian social evolution that, that, that occurred. Um, and so um, if we, uh, again, look at the, um, uh, the, the governments in the period 1450, and we'll talk more about this uh, in a bit, but the governments in the uh, 1450 to 1750, they began to see trade as a mechanism uh, to uh, earn revenue. We talked last time a little bit about how the, in, how the, in uh, Britain, uh, the, the kings lost the authority to tax without uh, the uh, benefit of parliament. And so they began to look for incentives. Okay, where else can I raise revenue? Uh, and and uh, tomorrow, on uh, Friday, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how that happened, but essentially the, 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 um, the uh, governmental institutions uh, began to look at ways to gain from trade, and one of the ways they did this was to sell uh, monopolies, charter, uh, charter monopolies. And um, again, if you, uh, if you uh, see um, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, that's within this era. We'll, talk more about that. Um, uh, now, also notice what happened was that you um, uh, got an increase in the population. That is, and, and you expect that. Where, where, you know, notice that anywhere where your standard of living is rising, then you get a, an increase in the population because you're, you, know, you have a, a better ability to keep your children alive, uh, and you have uh, a, a, you know, an increase in the population that occurs generally as we get an increase in the standard of living. So that's what you uh, observed in, uh, in the West, uh, as the feudal system gave way to, uh, to the era of trade, uh, you got an increase in, in the population. Now, um, the, uh, uh, again, the, what, the, the merchant class, they had a, uh, the idea of they would act according to their own plan, right? Because if that's how, uh, that's how the system would have to work. Um, it, it, and we, we noted that developed in the trading cities. Um, why did it out-compete? Because this is what Hayek talked about as liberty, right? Hayek's idea of liberty is that you need to act according to your own plan. Um, and that's necessary for uh, market capitalism to eventually develop. But for if you're a, a merchant, uh, you have to be able to decide, okay, I'm going to buy this stuff and then I'm going uh, to transport it. Uh, I'm going to have this many ships. I'm going to transport it from... Uh, uh, England to India. Uh, I'm then going to sell the stuff in India. I'm going to buy stuff there, bring it back, uh, whatever. I got to be able to decide what price I want to swap things at. Am I willing to swap at this price or whatever? Um, notice that you also had the idea of contracts. That is, if you were a uh, merchant, uh, you were used to making contracts. Okay, uh, you give me this money, I will uh, deliver this product. Uh, I will give you this money and you deliver me a ship. Uh, so this idea of contracts uh, and, uh, and this idea of property rights, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But the idea that you guys should be able to act according to your own plan and have market clearing prices, that is the dominant, the dominant philosophy that's out there. Where that was not the case if it was 1100 AD. Again, the, there's an a attitudinal difference uh, if this were 1100 AD, you wouldn't even be thinking about, uh, about trading. Uh, whereas if it's 1450, uh, 1500, 1600, now your attitude about how the social order ought to be is going to be very different. If this were the feudal period, you would think the social order was hierarchical, people are going to tell you what to do, whereas the merchant class has developed so that the, as they developed, they believed, hey, we got to make things at market clearing prices, we got to act according to our own plan, we got to have contracts, we got to have property rights, 
there's a whole different attitude about, about how the world ought to work. Um, there's also, along with the rise in population, there was urbanization occurred. In this period, 1450 to 1750, what do you see? You see the growth of cities, right? Um, the, you know, London becomes a, uh, a much larger place than it was in 900 AD or whatever. So, um, again, as you're seeing in China today, the, it, it, the, and we saw that the trading cities were out competing the feudal system. This period, 1450 to 1750, you get an acceleration of this. You get movements towards the, to, towards the city, but in addition, because the standard of living is higher there, the population is going to rise more there, and so uh, and so cities uh, develop. So this period, 1450 to 1750, is a is we see in the West urbanization, the the rise of the of cities, uh, and you see an increase in the population uh, over this period. Um, that is, uh, uh, and so what happens here? Now this system uh, produces innovation. And in the beginning of the, in the introduction to how the West grew rich, Brutal and Rosenberg say, what's the key to Western economic growth? It's innovation. That's the key. What did we talk about in, when we were uh, talking about profit? Why did you want profit? You wanted profit because it gives you an incentive to innovate. Um, we talked about the fact that you're not wealthier than the King of England in 1263. Uh, because you have more of the same stuff that he had, but that you have lots and lots of stuff that he didn't have. Uh, we, you know, we've mentioned the fact that you have, you know, you're much wealthier than the richest person in the world a hundred years ago, uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller, uh, you, because you have all sorts of stuff that John D. Rockefeller couldn't even imagine. So innovation happens in this period. Very, we said, look, very little innovation because there's no incentive to innovate in the fuel system. Fuel systems about custom and tradition, uh, just prices, hierarchical uh, world order, uh, whereas here you get innovation, but it's primarily innovation and trade. From 1450 to 1750, you don't innovate in terms of thinking of uh, a uh, new uh, network over which you're going to uh, uh, use the internet. Okay? What you're thinking of is innovation in how you get stuff from point A to point B. Now, um, there's more stuff in the world because now you can get things from India that you didn't used to get. If this were 1100, you didn't have tea. Okay? If you were living in London or Great Britain. Uh, you, you know, you did, you, if you were living on a manor somewhere, uh, you didn't have tea. But now you could get tea. Now we didn't invent tea. Okay? We didn't like have some uh, sort of uh, you know DNA thing that we're playing around with uh, you know the genes of some uh, plant to make tea. Okay, the way you got tea was somebody else already had tea, and now what you do is you swap your stuff, and so the people in India are getting stuff that they didn't used to be able to get, and you're getting stuff that uh, you didn't used to be able to get, and so there's more stuff around, and again trade uh, results in more output, and so you do have more stuff in the world, and you have different kinds of stuff where you are, but the innovation that's happening is not in the production of new product, it's rather in the trade that gets product from point A uh, to point B. So I mean, just things like the, you invent the, the sextant, right? Uh, you invent the three-mass schooner. Um, why, why? Because those things, well, make it so that you can make three trips instead of two trips. Or you can get your ship there uh, before the other person does. Um, you're not, you know, traveling all around the ocean, right? You can get from point A to point B because now you got a sex and you can figure out where the heck you are, right? So uh, the innovation is happening uh, in, in trade. And what that leads to is that if when I, when I innovate in trade, I expand the market, right? I can make more trips between point A and point B, or I can get from point A to point B that I didn't used to be able to get to. And so what happens? And now, as we saw, the demand curve 
uh, is what? It's the sum of the individual demand curves. And so what I can do is now I can get a shift that can go to India. I've now got a bigger demand curve than I used to. Uh, and so I expand the market. But once I expand the market, I have an incentive to innovate and further trade. Right? Because now the market's even bigger. So if I can get a bigger ship, or I can get a better ship, or whatever, then I can earn even more than I used to before, uh, before we expanded the market. But once I do this, what happens? The trade expands the market. And so what you do is you get this beneficial cycle. You get this beneficial uh, cycle in, uh, in innovation uh, in trade. And so that is one of the things that leads to the economic growth that's going on here is a innovation. Uh, again, no, no incentive to innovate in the fuel period. But by the time we get to 1450, fuel period's gone. Uh, now this period, 1450 to 1750, this becomes a cycle uh, where you get more and more innovation, but particularly uh, innovation is, uh, is occurring in, in, in trade. Um, this is a period of uh, steady but gradual growth in the standard of living. You get steady but gradual growth in the standard of living. And we've talked about this before, that is, um, we've talked about the rule of uh, 72. It says if I look at how fast something grows, or if we're going to interest rate, how long does it take for it to double? That's the rate of growth times the number of years comes out to be 72 for it to double. So if you had a 1% annual growth, look at that. See, I'm, I'm trying to work on, let's say, on my board handwriting, and that was not very good. Okay. Um, A 1% annual growth, what's going to happen is that in 72 years, you'll double, right? Which means that your grandchildren will be, if we have 1% annual growth, your grandchildren will be twice as wealthy as you are. And their grandchildren will be twice as wealthy as they are. And then their grandkids will be twice as wealthy as they are. So if you look at over a 250-year period, what's going to happen is you're going to be eight times wealthier than you were before because, you're, because it's two to the third, right? So that, so that you, you get this exponential growth over time. So you don't need to have super fast growth in order to get to where uh, your great grandkids are much wealthier than you. If this were the period 900 to 1450, right, during the feudal period, you didn't have 1% growth. You, your kids are gonna look like what you look like, right? And your grandkids are going to be no more wealthier than you are. At least that's that's what you are believing, uh, which is going to be the case because you because the feudal system isn't a system designed to give economic growth, right? It's a system designed to try to give stability, um, which again collapses when you get the droughts and the plagues and stuff. You know, then then, then it can't. It's not dynamic. So if you look at two percent, then it's going to double in 36 years, which means that your children are going to be twice as wealthy as you are. Then your grandkids are going to be four times as wealthy as you are. So this is a big increase in the standard of living compared to what was going on in the feudal period. So you don't need huge amounts of growth in order to get increases over time in the standard of living, particularly if we're looking at lengthy periods of time, the feudal system where you guys are looking at hundreds of years where things don't change very much. 1450 to 1750, you're getting one to two percent standard growth. You're not getting like eight percent. You're not getting, you know, 15 percent one year and nothing the next year. You're getting, because the system's changing, you're getting steady gradual growth, but that can have a large effect over, over uh, in, in any period of time. Um, the, uh, one of the things that happened was the Chinese uh, dropped out of the system. Um, 
if you look at the Chinese, what happened? They decide to avoid uh, this uh, um, uh, trading system. They decide that, in fact, what happens is um, the Chinese were more advanced than the West. Uh, up to the 18th century. Uh, for example, the Chinese invented the crossbow. Remember we said that in the 12th century, um, the uh, crossbow was uh, uh, outlawed against Christian nation, Pope Innocent. Um, did anybody know when the Chinese invented the crossbow? 700 BC. <laughs> okay, so like the Chinese, if this were the 1400s, the early 1400s, Chinese had much better sailing ships than the West did. But then what happened was the emperor decided, particularly with trade with the, 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 the main, one of the main trading party uh, partners was uh, the Netherlands uh, with China, the emperor decides that if the, if the Chinese start engaging in international trade, what's going to happen? Their society's going to change, right? Their social structure's going to change. And they didn't want that to happen. And so they decided to, mm, we're not going to engage in trade. And know what happens is they get stuck in the Middle Ages. Uh, and so the Chinese, up until what happens, uh, the Chinese fall way behind the rest of the world, even though for centuries they've been way ahead of the rest of the world, by deciding to step back from what was going on in the West in the terms of international trade, they step back and remain stuck where they are, pretty much. 1978, the Chinese decide to step back into the world of international trade uh, and get enormous amounts of economic growth. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, poverty in China, uh, went from 88% uh, of uh, uh, people living in poverty in China, it was 88% in 1980, uh, it was down to 9% uh, by 2017, okay? So uh, what happened? What happened was they became engaged in international trade, as the president has told us about. But in any event, um, the, 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 so this is an example of why did the West grow rich? The West was growing rich in this period because of this engaging in international trade. Why did the Chinese grow rich? Why were they well ahead and then fell behind? They fell behind because they decided not to uh, become involved in, the, in international trade. Um, one of the reasons that, that um, you get to get this freedom to act is the ability to navigate oceans uh, created an ability <coughs> to act according to their own plan. Because what happened? You could avoid governmental restrictions. If you, uh, it, it was not possible really to stop smuggling until the last part of the 18th, 19th, and the early part of the 19th century. So um, if I was, if I were uh, the King of England, and I have restrictions on what you can trade and what you can't trade, guess what? We can just avoid that by trading somewhere else, right? We can, and if we had a tariff, then what happens is if you can, you don't have a mechanism to collect the tariff, we're just going to avoid the tariff. Or we'll trade things that you're not supposed to be able to trade. So what is that called? Uh, that's called smuggling. Right? Um, uh, smuggling is when you make a trade, you make an exchange that you're not supposed to. If somebody says you can't take uh, marijuana and, uh, from Mexico and sell it in the United States, then if you do that, what do they call that? You smuggled marijuana into the United States. What was going on here is you're not paying for the taxes or the tariffs that you're supposed to have when you're selling stuff into the colonies. And the colonies aren't paying it. Right? The colonies, so what happens is the merchant class in the colonies, in particular, the merchant class in the colonies 
What do they begin to think? They be think you should just be able to act according to your own plan. They don't. They they are they're basically ignoring the restrictions uh, that the uh, that, that the, the, the king of England uh, was was putting on. So um, what happens is 1763 uh, in the. The King George III, right? In 1763, uh, the king uh, decides to uh, enforce the taxes on uh, tea. And what happens, right? We have the Boston Tea Party, right? Because there, the, when the king was trying to uh, uh, pay for the Seven Years' War. So 1763, they say, hey, we're going to crack down on this. We're going to make sure we're collecting these taxes. These darn colonists are just running around and, and doing things uh, without paying their taxes. They're smuggling stuff across. Uh, they're not uh, the, uh, uh, reacting to the restrictions that we want on trade. And we're just going to make, we're just going to enforce this. Well, by then, the attitudes have changed. By then, the merchant class is the dominant class. And the merchant class is figured they should be able to act according to their own plan, and they're going to revolt. So what do you see? You, you, at that point, you figure out that you've got inalienable rights, right? And among these are the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness, okay? And what are the governments supposed to do? Um, the government's supposed to protect those rights. That would be farm government for. That attitude, very different, right? If this were 1100, that attitude wasn't there. By the time we get to the end of this period, that's the ad dominant attitude by the, by, by the time we get to this period. Um, in fact, uh, on page 95, um, this is a quote from Brazil and Rosenberg. They say, the merchants and shipwrights had made the intellectual shift from feudal hierarchical society to the conception of society as an association of individuals, each with certain inalienable rights not to be abridged by government. Right? So, what are they saying? Where would we expect this idea of you should act according to your own plan, you've got inalienable rights, government's just there to protect those rights. They, you expect that to happen where trade is developed. You expect that to happen among the merchant class, and that's uh, what Burtzell and, uh, and Rosenberg point out. Now, if you look at um, 1776, what do you get? You get the Declaration of Independence. Right? But you also get, at the same time, 1776, you get Adam Smith writing the uh, Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. It's not unrelated. What is Adam Smith doing? Adam Smith is in the, in the uh, Wealth of Nations, he's describing the system. He's not saying, here's what the system ought to look like, but what he's doing is he says, okay, it's now 1776, the world looks a lot different than it did, uh, you know, in the Middle Ages. What's different? What's going on? And why is it working? Why is it that the wealthiest Scotsman, or excuse me, the, the poorest Scotsman is wealthier than the greatest uh, African tribal chief, uh, when the Scotsman is the poorest person in, in, uh, in Great Britain? And so he's describing what's going on, and one of the things he's describing about is that you guys uh, have specialization of labor, uh, you have trade, you have the ability to act according to your own plan. All this stuff the founders were well aware of. So the, it's, not, um, it's not an anomaly that Adam Smith's writing Wealth of Nations at the same time as the colonists are writing the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's because the economic and social structure has developed uh, so that by the time we get to the end of this period, 1450 to 1750, people believe that the best way to, to you know, the, 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 what the social structure should be, people believe the social structure should be one of individual liberty and, and limited government, which is what you need for market capitalism to develop. And uh, market capitalism, really is beginning to become the dominant system in the next period, 1750 to 1880. Well, that, that chapter will be talking about the development of market capitalism. But over this period, 1450 to 1750, you've moved, just like 900 to 1450, you move from 
strictly feudal system to market capitalism. 1450 to 1750, you move from, we've got uh, a, uh, the, the era of trade, it becomes greater and greater economic growth, more and more belief in the people's individuals, uh, individuals being able to act according to their own plan, and uh, movement towards uh, an increase in the standard of, uh, standard of living. Um, that leads us to what sort of institutions developed in this period, uh, 1450 to 1750, in the West. Um, if you were the king of Sudan, let's say you were, I don't know if they have a king, whatever they have. So you, let's say you're appointed the king of Sudan. Um, and uh, you go, wow, I've read uh, Mises' liberalism. I know that the only way to create wealth for the masses is to have market capitalism. Uh, let's go to market capitalism. Let's make that happen. Well, what you'll have to know is that market capitalism didn't just spring forth, right? It developed over time. And one of the things that developed in this period, 1450 to 1750 in the West, was a bunch of institutions that are necessary for market capitalism to function. And so you don't have to develop those institutions because they're already there, right? The West developed them over a 300 year period. But you gotta make sure that they're there. You gotta make sure that, that, your, that Sudan uh, has these institutions that developed in the West over a, over a long period of time. So uh, the first of these institutions As a legal system that gives predictable results. A legal system uh, that gives predictable results. Because if market capitalism is going to happen, you need such a system. In this period, 1450 to 1750, if I'm going to uh, decide to outfit a ship, or if I'm going to contract with somebody to build a ship, I gotta know what the rules of the game are. I gotta know that somebody's not gonna just come out and say, oh no, you can't have three mass schooners. Um, and so what happens in the West is we develop this system uh, where I know what the predictable results are gonna be. Remember when, when you just answered the, on the second midterm, you answered what are the characteristics of the law that Hayek thinks will minimize coercion. And one of those was predictability, right? The law should be predictable. What happens in the West? We develop what was called common law. We'll talk about this in my law and economics class. Um, but what happened in the West, what happened in Great Britain in particular, was the idea of common law. And what was common law? It was to say, OK, we're going to look at this situation. And if it looks like a prior situation, we're going to say the law is the same in both instances. So if there's a legal question, uh, we're going to look at and say, okay, what's been happening in the past? Common law says, here's the way we've been doing it in the past, therefore the judge is going to say, that's the way we're doing it now. So you know what the law is. You, just, you, you, you have an idea of what the law is, which was not the case in much of the rest of the world, right? And so common law develops, and then by we get to the 19th century um, in France, uh, you have statutory law um, for various reasons, but none of you know part of which the uh, French thought the judges would have too much power in common law. But bottom line is, you still have it written down. Here's what the law is. I know what the law is. So in the West, you have a legal system where you know what the rules of the game are. Market capitalism isn't going to develop someplace where you don't know what the rules of the game are. Um, and that's, you know, that's what, what Hayek called what? The rule of law versus the rule of man. Um, a, a, a second institution uh, that developed is uh, the development of uh, credit and banking. You don't need credit and banking um, the, in the period uh, 900 to 1450. Okay. Um, when do I need credit banking? When I am, not, you know, I am going to outfit this ship, right? So I'm going to buy up all this stuff, and then I'm going to take the ship and I'm going to take it to India, and I'm going to sell the stuff over there, right? And then I'm going to buy stuff in India, and I'm going to bring it back or whatever. In order for that to happen, I got to have the money at the beginning to buy the ship and to buy the stuff that's going to go on the ship. 
Now, one of the things that Berzell and Rosenberg said, what did you develop in the West? In the West, what you did was you developed the decentralization of the authority to make decisions, right? And so what's going on here is the only people that could engage in merchant uh, activity without credit and banking would be rich people, people who could afford to buy the ship to start with and buy the stuff. But what do we need? We need it to have it just not just rich people can be merchants. We need to have it so that people who have a, uh, you know, can, can uh, uh, make, make a, uh, uh, additional uh, value uh, could become merchants. Um, and so the, the, we, we have this need for credit and banking to develop. So what happens? It develops. And we're going to see the same thing's going to happen uh, in corporations. Nobody woke up one day and said, oh, I guess we should have banks, right? 1130, you don't have banks, okay? When do you need banks? Where do banks start, right? Banks don't start in uh, South America, right? Banks start in Great Britain. Banks start where you got a need for it. So you need banks, you need credit and banking in order to make it so that you can decentralize the authority to have trade undertaken. And so uh, if you're going to have a, uh, uh, you, again, you don't need to invent this. If you're at Sudan, you don't need to invent this legal system. You could look at what does the legal system look like. You can take my class in law and economics. Uh, and you can know, okay, this is what we ought to do, right? Uh, you can uh, have it so that Bank of America or, uh, or uh, J.P. Morgan can operate within the Sudan. If you don't have banks, you're going to have a problem, right? So, again, you don't have to invent banks. You don't have to invent credit, uh, but you have to uh, have it available. Uh, a third thing that develops in this time is insurance. Notice what insurance do is insurance allows you to uh, uh, spread the risk. Now, um, let's think about uh, the book, uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, not the movie. Um, in the book, in, in the movie, right, we mentioned that uh, Beauty's father is a tinker, right? Um, but in the book, Beauty's father is a merchant. Um, and he's got three ships, and he sends them off, uh, and he's living in town, they got a nice house in town, etc. Um, and then what happens? The ships get shipwrecked, gets word back. Ships are shipwrecked. He doesn't have any money, uh, so what do they got to do? They got to sell the house in town, in the city, and move out to this place in the countryside. Well, while he's out in the countryside, uh, Beauty's father's walking along, and he sees this flower, and picks the flower. Well, it turns out that the flower is owned by the beast. Right, because the beast castle there, and he says, hey, I got property rights to that flower, and so what does he do? He takes Beauty's father, um, he's holding Beauty's father, but then he's got a magic mirror, and he could uh, talk to Beauty, uh, and, or you know, see Beauty, so uh, then what happens is Beauty switches places with her father, um, Beauty then uh, falls in love with the beast, and the beast falls in love with Beauty, uh, and then they kiss, and when they kiss and fall in love, beauty, uh, the beast turns into a prince, and then they live happily ever after. Well, none of that would have happened if there had been insurance. Okay? Um, what would have happened was, uh, you know, Beauty's father would have collected on the insurance, and they'd still be living in town, and the beast would still be living in the castle for all we know. Right? So, what does insurance do? What, what happens with insurance is it says, I'm going to take on uh, this risk uh, uh, of the market transaction, right? You're going to outfit a ship, and someone else takes on the risk uh, of uh, a disaster, right? Of an untoward circumstance, of the ship, you know, thing being shipwrecked or pirates taking it or whatever. So, um, what does that mean? It means that I'm more, I'm more likely to outfit a ship than if I have to bear all the burden of the risk. Let's say you're going to buy a house. If you buy a house, you take on the burden that what would happen if the house burnt down, right? You, you spent all this money on the house, house burns down, uh, then you still don't have a house, but you've spent all this money on the house. 
So you might say, well, gee, I'm just going to rent instead. But if someone says, you know what, I will take on the risk that the house burns down. You pay me. Uh, you pay me so much a year, and I will take on the risk that the house burns down. You're more likely to be willing to buy a house. Similarly here, I'm more likely to be uh, willing to outfit a ship uh, if I only have to take on the market risk. Somebody else is going to take on the risk that the ship will sink or be, uh, be uh, captured by uh, pirates or something. And so more ships will be outfitted, more actions will be undertaken if you have, uh, if you have insurance. And so again, uh, if you're in Sudan, you don't have to invent insurance. Insurance got invented in the West. You didn't need insurance in 1100 AD, right? The king didn't need insurance. He was a serf, didn't need insurance. None of that happened. When does insurance happen? Insurance happens when there's a need for it, when we, have, when we start to have trade going on. So uh, again, you don't have to invent it. Uh, you can have the Geico uh, caveman or the Geico gecko uh, can, uh, you know, as long as they can operate uh, in Sudan, uh, then, then, then you're fine. Uh, uh, you know, we, we developed this idea of insurance over time. Um, the, uh, then there was a, a development of uh, a um, uh, systematic taxation Uh, versus expropriation. <laughs> that is, I'm not going to build a ship uh, or I'm not going to outfit a ship if the government can just come along and take the ship, right? Or I'm not going to start a shipyard where we're making ships if what happens is the government could come in any day and just take the up. I again need to know some certainty of what's going on. If you, have, if you, I mean, one of the one of the problems that Venezuela has is the government came along and just seized the refineries of Exxon Mobil and some and other uh, uh, foreign companies. Well, you're not going to get an oil company to put an oil refinery in Venezuela now, right? Because you don't know if they're just going to seize the thing. So in the in the Middle Ages, in the feudal period. They could just come along and take their, your stuff if they needed to fight a war, if the Lord needed it to fight a, you know, a battle or something. You didn't have a systematic taxation. But if you know that you're going to pay $500 per ship, I now can say, okay, I know what the marginal cost of the ship is. It's now going to be $500 higher than it was before. But if the marginal benefit of making the ships bigger than the marginal cost, then I'll go ahead and make the ship. If I don't know what's going to happen if I make the ship, if I don't know that the government, whether the government just come out and take it, I'm much less likely to, to make the ship. So you need a systematic taxation versus expropriation, which is what we have uh, in the West, right? We move to the systematic. Te so you know, uh, for example, in the state of Michigan, uh, what do you have? You have a the state of Michigan levies a sales tax, right? And you know what the sales tax is. Um, in fact, uh, you know because uh, we have a uh, general principles by which we govern ourselves and the Constitution laid out in you know, the state of Michigan, you can't have a sales tax more than 6%. If you wanted to raise the sales tax, a temporary majority want to make it 8%, they'd have to change the Constitution to do that. So you know what it is. You know that there's an income tax of 4.195% in the state of Michigan. You know that's what it is, right? And the state just can't come in and, and take your stuff. So you, if you know what the, the, uh, 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 the, the taxation is going to be, you can compare the marginal cost of doing something with the marginal benefit of doing something and make that decision. If you're uncertain about whether the government's just going to take and ex uh, expropriate your stuff, then you're going to be uh, like Venezuela. Um, and then last of the, um, we uh, have this uh, development of the institution of property rights. That is, we, we noted that as the, in the trading cities, you needed to have this idea of property rights in order for trade to happen. We get to 1450 to 1750, we get a systematic uh, analyzation of what, what property rights are. 
you can't have economic growth, you know, what is what it means to say, right? Property rights are the key to civilization, right? Hayek talks about property rights as being a, uh, a, a fundamental uh, a way to create a sphere of free action. Uh, markets don't exist without property rights. So this period 1450 to 1750, as the world is now engaged in trade, in order for trade to happen, I gotta know what the property rights are for trade to happen. And so 1450 to 1750, we get a solid understanding uh, of what property rights are and a, and a, and a sol solid development of property rights. If you read articles by, or uh, uh, books actually by Hernando de Soto, uh, is an author that looks at uh, uh, South America and why South America hasn't had the economic growth that you might have anticipated. And his, he shows that it's the lack of development of property rights that's been the problem. You may have a house, but you don't really have the property rights to the house. Whereas if you're in the city of Hillsdale, right, you'll have a deed that'll say, you know, the government will know this is, you know, you own this property and you know exactly what it looks like and exactly who owns it and everything else. So if you want to sell your house, um, people are willing to buy it because they know it's, it's your house, right? They can, uh, they, they can look at a deed, deed restrictions, etc. All right, so for Friday, what we're gonna do is we will finish the institutions, that chapter on the institutions, and move into the chapter 1750 to 1880. What we're gonna, what goal, my goal is to get to where uh, the last lecture is April 30th, it's the last day of class. So I, I'd like to have the last four lectures be in macro. So we'll try to finish How the West Grew Rich on the Friday for the four days that are left. I don't know what the whole day is. But anyway, Friday would be the last day, and then we'll have four days of lecture, four lectures on, uh, on the macro side. All right? Okay, so I will see you on Friday.